Felix, thank you very much for the kind invitation and the nice introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a great honor and pleasure to be here with you and to talk about a very exciting topic. It's not the heart valve itself, but it's the miracle of nature. And I will do my very best, and I will start with a little picture at the bottom here. You can see. Uh, this is a hydrogen atom, everybody knows it, and we have a lot of hydrogen in our body and in the heart valves, and 70% of the matter in the universe is hydrogen. But the question is, why does this negatively charged electron not go directly into the positively charged nucleus, which we would expect from our world, where the electrical current grows, goes from one pole to the other? but it is not the case in the atoms. So let's go to other miracles that we can see. This is the early development of the aortic valve. And, uh, oh, this was the wrong, how can I come back? Yes, um, this is the early development of the aortic valve and neurological uh, crest cells are migrating to the outflow tract to uh, develop the aortic valves, together with, three, with two other types of, of valves. One of those are endocardial cushions, or uh, uh, endocardial cells, which need a transformation into mesenchymal cells, and the process of transformation is shown here. Look how complicated this process is, and the question is, where is the information, which uh, transition factor has to, go, to come first and then, so it's a great miracle how this works. And the other miracle is, what about the environment? I have often seen in bicuspid aortic valve surgery that the uh, interventricular septum was not normal. And I can imagine that there is some flow and physiological distribution in the outflow tract that may have an influence via mechanical transduction also on the development of the endocardial cushions. So it's an interesting question because we don't have a real master gene for the bicuspid aortic valves. Um, but if everything works well, we get, or the result is an aortic valve, or you know this valve, and this is uh, one leaflet, and it looks very simple, like a membrane of collagen, but if we go a little bit further into it, as an endoscopic view at 80 millimeters of mercury, we see the commissure here, two leaflets, and the insert shows that there are strong collagenous fibers connected with the hammock-shaped membranes. This is a microscopic view, the strong fibers here. The membrane it looks like a suspension bridge at the same principle. If we go a little bit further in the deep, in the depths, we see a scanning electron microscopy view of a porcine aortic valve, and this is an interstitial cell with um, long extensions uh, serving for the hemostasis of these collagenous fibers. And now we go a step further in the depths, and we don't see an image. We don't see a sketch. Why? We don't have the possibility yet to show images of hydrogen's atoms. But this is a collagen triple helix with an amino acid here, and again, there is a lot of hydrogen atoms. But what we know is that during growth, there is a lot of turnover of collagen because collagen must be deconstructed and reconstructed for new and growth factors. So there is a big need for a very quick uh, turnover of, um, of this material, and this is uh, done by an, en by an enzyme uh, called collagenase. And now we are on the active side of collagenase. You see here the collagen, here is the glutamate of the uh, collagenase, and at the bottom is a zinc atom. It belongs also to the collagenase, and what I wanted to show you is this dashed line here, and this resembles the uh, inter, um, how is it called, the transition state of these different atoms here. Again, the hydrogen atom and the bold line is the peptide bond which needs to be broken down. And a lot of movement occurs against energy barriers at this area here to finally break down the peptide bonds for reconstruction of new 
uh, of new uh, um, substrates. But even if you multiply all these known factors for acceleration of enzymatic reaction, together with the most that you can achieve is about a million-fold enhancement in reaction time. This is a puny, a small number compared to the enhancement that enzymes are known to deliver. So there must be something additional. And now look here. Hydrogen tunneling in enzyme reactions. Please keep in mind this hydrogen, this word tunneling. And now we are at the greatest miracle ever, the greatest theory in physics, the greatest theory in life, and that is quantum mechanics. And now we all go into it. And don't be afraid. There is no stress for you to understand anything. <laughs> Nobody in this world understands mechanical, uh, quantum mechanics, but it is reality. So let's start with the beginning. And it is 1900 in Berlin, not far away from here. I think one kilometer away, it was Max Planck who first termed the, uh, coined the term quantum because he wanted to describe the radiation of a black body. And it, that only works if he calculates the energy in portions. And he called it quantum. And that was the beginning of the quantum mechanics and was further developed by these names, you all know it, Bohr, Einstein, Heisenberg, Schrödinger, and so on. And this was the wave function. It's a very important function in the calculation of um, the quantum mechanics. And what you can see is the result is an imaginary number. It is the square root of minus one. That is not possible. There is an imaginary number, and this is the sense of quantum mechanics. It is uncertainty. It is probability. You never know what happens in this world, in this atomic and subatomic world. And this is so great that um, I show you some very interesting experiments. And this is probably the most attractive experiment ever. This is the two-slit experiment. If you throw two stones into water, you see waves for, for each stone. And if these waves come together, there occurs an interference pattern, meaning that two hills of a wave come together, you get a higher. And if uh, one hill and one valley comes together, it is zero. There is a very well-known interference pattern. And the same occurs if you take light. In front of two slits, there's a diffraction on the, on the other side, and you get an interference pattern on the screen. That is what we would expect. Now we go on. If you take sand to the both of those slits, then you find two rows of sand at the bottom. Everybody understands it. it's no problem. And now it comes. If we take electrons, electrons are particles, that is mass, it is particles, and if we uh, um, put these electrons again, these two, again, these two slits, we would expect, because of the particles, something else like the sand, the rows, but we what we find is an interference pattern on the screen. What is this? So the electrons must behave like a wave. So electrons, particles, can change to a wave, can have the characteristic of a wave. And then we want to see what is going on behind this slit and put a measurement device behind the first, uh, behind the slits. And want to see, is the electron coming through the slit or what is going on in between? And then we turn on our measurement and what occurs, what we find on the screen, two rows of electrons. Does this electron know that we look at it? So when we measure, the quantum world breaks together, collapses. This is called decoherence. And this is an extremely important word, decoherence. This is where we live. But it is not real life. You, don't, you can't imagine it, me too. But it is reality. I would go on. But the quantum world 
has even more crazy characteristics. Look here. In our world, if we have to cross energy barriers, we have to go up the hill and to come to the product on the other side. In the quantum world, the particles can go through the hill. That is called tunneling. And you remember that tunneling was also found in the enzymatic reaction with collagenase. And this is the solution of the secret that the collagenase it has such a high turnover rate. This is done by quantum physics here. But this is not all. The crazy line goes on. In our world, we cannot go as a skier on both sides of the tree. But in the quantum world, it's no problem. A quantum particle can go on this side, on that side, at the same time. And not only at two sides, it can go at 3,000 sides everywhere. This is quantum. You don't believe, me too. So, and yet now comes the most interesting thing. You, you will be astonished. Einstein, Podolsky, and Rose, they did a um, theoretical experiment. They said, if we have two photons, and let them go apart, one photon this direction, one photon this direction. Theoretically, if we change the spin, the rotation of one of this photon, then the other photon must know it. Einstein, and must know it instantaneously, faster than the speed of light. And Einstein said, no, I don't believe in spooky action at a distance. At a distance. That is not possible in, our, in what, we, what we theoretically thought. But 1982, in the University of Paris, it was shown that it is possible. That is really possible. That is a so-called entanglement, a verschränkung between the two parts in the atomatic and subatomatic area. And it's shown here as a wave configuration. They are in contact, this part and this part, in contact with each other. And please keep in mind that the wave at the node here has no, normally no movement, and there is no energy. We will come back to this, it's very important. So the particles stay connected via a shared wave function until measurement, when the wave function collapses. If you look at it, it goes away. So we go to the next picture. And the entanglement was recently shown is not only with two particles, it is shown that 3,000 atoms uh, can, can get the information instantaneously by one little photon. And it was recently shown that we are in our retina uh, have the possibility to uh, recognize one single photon. It is hardly to imagine. And one photon can indeed inform 3,000 atoms instantaneously. And very recently, it was shown that this can occur at a distance of 33 kilometers. And theoretically, it is possible at distance from one end of the Milky Way to the other, instantaneously. So here's a picture of three levels of reality. This is the reality where we live. This is a Newton world that we can see. This is steam. Uh, airplane, and so on. The next step is thermodynamics. There is random movement of the particles. If you boil water, there's random movement, and that make, makes the, the steam. But at the bottom, here, there is quantum mechanics. There's the root of life. There's choreographic movement, a very fine-tuned choreographic movement. And uh, if you are interested in it, I can show you a, a book, and, and you will be astonished. And you can see here that the connection to life goes down to this area here. And some kinds say that you cut this connection that is not going on with life. But together, this is the big picture. I call it the big picture, or the big hole, or whatever it is. And Gribben, a, a physicist, an astronom, and cooperator of nature, once said, every element is in a certain sense in contact with the big picture, is the holistic principle of the world. And can we use quantum mechanics? Yes. Our MRI is quantum mechanics. Handy is quantum mechanics. This is quantum mechanics. Everything with, is, with IT is quantum mechanics. But can we use quantum mechanics for biology? That is a, a big point. And there is indeed a new discipline that it is called synthetic biology. And you will hear of this 
her, hear of this in the next years of synthetic biology. And the first step was um, this group and created a, um, a biologically and inspired photocell mimicking the, the photosynthesis of nature by quantum coherence. And furthermore, just recently published by Henry Hess was a microscopic electric made motor of DNA. And this is indeed a, a very tiny motor that can do mechanical work. And the first, um, re, um, the first experiments have started with 3D printing to reconstruct or construct uh, biological tissue. But the question is, where's the plan? How to steer? the 3D printing. And this is a very interesting picture, a very interesting publication, 2018 in Nature. 1922, a research group took a piece, a so-called organizer of a pigmented salamander embryo on, an, uh, um, on an under, an, another unpigmented salamander embryo. And what they found is a new salamander, uh, pigmented, unpigmented embryo um, those that this organizer has um, um, made a new, or the, the host, uh, steered the host cells, the host to do a new salamander. And very recently, another search group, it was Porquet, I think, he used human um, embryological cells and activated with WNT and Activine and found uh, organizer-like tissue, put it on the um, chicken embryo, and what they found is a host-derived, a host-derived neurological neural tissue, which is an indication for a plan of a body. So there seems to be some kind of a plan that takes care of how all these constructions are performed. But this, what I told you, was future, but it is future, it will become future, but in the meantime, I will show you from my experience some example of the whole of the big thing in relation to the aortic valve. The first is the left ventricular aortic valve is sitting in water, then the living material and bionics. Here it is shown the movement, the continuous movement of the aortic root. Here's the base and here's the leaflets. And what you see is during a cycle contraction, the leaflets already close. And this occurs because if, um, this occurs because you close or you, you decrease the circumference, then the flow increases, and with increasing flow at the leaflets, you get a venturi effect, a suction on the leaflets and during systole, in almost 70%, this, uh, the uh, aortic valve closes already. It is not the diastolic pressure or the di diastolic flow coming back. This is only the last closure, but the most of the closure is systolic. It is going, it is going in the closing position during systole. So all structures are distensible and functionally co uh, connected. So again, it is a holistic principle. And even if you change the shape of the aortic arch from a Romanesque shape uh, to the Gothic shape, you get an, a resistance to the left ventricle. Here's the gradient shown the gradient. And sometimes it occurs in coarctation, TGA, and Norwood. And I will show you some examples. Somebody, or maybe you have seen this picture after an adherent switch operation. And this causes early pulse wave reflection, dilatation of the ascending aorta, this sharp angled aortic arch here. Aortic regurgitation, late after adherent switch operation. This is the normal Romanesque shape, though the big picture is not respected. But is there a possibility? to have an alternative in this Swiss operation. And uh, recently, 2016, Rickers et al. published a, um, uh, a paper in the consecutive five patients where the ascending aorta was cut more distally. The uh, length was gained by movement of the aortic arch head and the head vessels. And also by liberating the hilus, so there was enough length for directly connecting in a spiral fashion the great vessels. And this is an MRI of one patient. You clearly can see the Romanesque shape, and you can see that the pulmonary root has migrated to the left side. Uh, these five patients were reinvestigated 20 years when they were grown up. 
Uh, 20 years after the operation, there was the physiological Romanesque arch, no articular uh, aneurysm, no similar valve dysfunction, one pulmonary trunk stenosis of 20 millimeters of mercury, where a pericardial tube of one centimeter was used to elongate the pulmonary artery. That was uh, all from the valves. In comparison to nine patients with the Lecomte technique, there were five seminular valve dysfunctions. So there seems to be an, alter, an alternative, at least in some patients, to get more of the big picture and the whole. And this should be a video. We checked it yesterday, and then it was a video. And now it is there. And you can see this was the 40 flow after this kind of operation, and it's hardly to distinguish uh, from, uh, from normal. So there was no branch stenosis. I just read a paper with branch stenosis after Lecomte technique, and it is not so very seldom. So it seems to be an alternative. Now I come to the next point that is living material, and you know that I am a fan of the Ross operation, and I did some 650 cases, and followed almost all patients, 96% over 20 or 25 years, with echocardiography, and what we found is that there was a reoperation rate of roughly 1% per patient year, even after 20 years, but there was a near normal survival, low pacemaker indication, low thrombomyelis, no drugs. But the question is, with increasing new technology, there increase also new questions, new discussions. And the question is, Ross operations versus Teva plus valve and valve. And I think that could be a topic in this session. And this is the last slide. What I wanted to show you is the, the flight of a, a SWIFT. And you can see here at a special velocity, the cross section of the SWIFT resembles very closely the cross section of the leaflet of a mechanical heart valve. And this, was a tree, this is a part of a tree leaflet valve showing here. There are three, three leaflets. And this is a picture from the left ventricle. This is directly at the explantation, one here in sheep with aspirin only, without anticoagulation, in a size 21 in a 78 kilogram sheep. Um, there was a mean pressure vein of five millimeters of mercury, less than five millimeters of mercury, and by direct measurement with a the catheter, there was no pressure gradient, there was no thrombus, no thromboembolism. So if we use bionics, if we use the whole part of the whole picture of the nature, then probably we can have also very interesting results coming more to the natural behavior. So I come now to the solution of the first slide. You know here, and now we look at this. And this was published very recently. It is a quantum-like image, a quantum-like demonstration of the hydrogen atom. And you can see here the different uh, um, uh, possibilities, only probability where the electron can be. And this is more or less a, a charged cloud around the proton, around the nucleus. And I, I say to you, why does this negative electron not go directly to the nucleus? And keep, um, remember this wave function. And at the node of the wave, there is no movement. And where no movement is, there is no energy. And where no energy is, there is no attraction force. And the node of these waves here is in the nucleus. And therefore, there's no attraction force for the electron. Ladies and gentlemen, I hoped it was a little interest for you. And heart valves are a miracle. Nature is a miracle. And I thank you very much. Take care of yourself and take care of this great miracle that is no planet B. Thank you very much.